The scripture for today's sermon comes from John 3:14 through 17. The word of God speaks to us like this. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, so that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. For God loved the world in this way. He gave his only one and only Son, so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send a son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. This is the very word of God to us. Thanks, Thanks be, be to, to God. God. Thanks, Raina. Um, you guys can grab a seat. John 3, like you just heard it read, that's where we'll be. Um, I remember, I was thinking of this this week as I was preparing this sermon. When I was seven or eight, somewhere in there, um, I had I'd been part of a Sunday school class where uh, the teacher was like, hey, do you... <laughs> It was, it was very interesting, the environment I, I was going in. The teacher was something along the lines of like, do you want to burn in hell for all of eternity or do you want to be with your parents when you die, like in heaven? <laughs> and I was like, oh my gosh. And you know, it's funny, I still remember this. I had no concept of like, what, is, what does that mean? But I do remember earlier that week, I, like n- no lie, earlier that week, I'd been outside. We lived in Yuma, Arizona, uh, which at least it's a dry heat apparently. And um, there was a fire ant out back. I didn't know what a fire ant was, but I thought the ant was my friend. And I specifically remember this. I was playing with the ant, and uh, my friend bit me, and it burnt really, really bad. And I remember when my teacher was saying that, I thought of that moment and was like, well, that was terrible. And so if it's anything like that, like, I don't, I don't want that. And then, um, so, I, you know, I came home, and I, I talked with my dad about this, and my dad did some damage control, and I think was like, hey, you know, there's a God who really loves you, and he sent his son for you, and all that, and I remember at that moment, as, as, as much as I could understand with a seven or eight-year-old heart, like, I, I really was blown away that God would love me enough to send his son to rescue me, and so I, I feel like that was one moment among many where Jesus really captivated my heart, and um, a couple of years after that, I was like five at that time. A couple of years after that, we'd moved to Michigan. And I remember I had this friend who lived on the street, and I asked him one day, I was like, hey, are you saved? And he was like, I don't know what that means. You know, so I'm like little kid, a lot like my daughter, honestly, right now, like very zealous and just like, are you saved? And he's like, from what? What does that mean? And I was like, you're not saved? Man, hold on. We can't, we can't play together unless you pray, the, pray this prayer. <laughs> It was like, thank the Lord, please Jesus, I hope he's done something else in this kid's life because I may have ruined a lot of things. But I was like, well, I will play with you today, but first we got to, you know, we got to pray, we got to pray this prayer. And if you think about it, like, if you grew up in the church, that, that question or the concept of are you saved or am I saved is a normal one. It's, it's what we call Christianese. Like a lot of times we have our own lingo that, you know, is like atonement, redemption, are you saved? Are you washed in the blood? How's your heart? Like, we have these things that we say that if you think about it, you're like, that's kind of odd. Like, am, am I saved? Am I, am I saved from what? Like, what is that? And I remember, you know, him asking me, like, what is that? And I think my response was something along the lines of like, it's kind of like Nike, you just do it, you know? It's like, <laughs> I don't know. Anyway... It really is an odd question, I, and our text today is going to answer that question. Like, what does it mean to be saved? What, what, like, what, when, when followers of Jesus use that term, are you saved? I'm saved. I'm saved by Jesus, by the grace of Jesus. Like, what does it mean to be saved? Now, let me catch you up a bit to where we are. We're in a series in the Gospel of John, uh, which is one of the four accounts in the Bible about the life and the ministry of Jesus, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And so we've been in this Gospel of John where we've said, like, hey, we want to like, meet the real Jesus. What, what's he like? What does he do? What's he care about? Was he really God? That's crazy. Did he claim to be God? All these things. We're spending a long time in the Gospel of John. And so we're, we're getting into chapter 3, and what's happened just before this is we, we had this really odd text at the end of chapter 2 where it said there was all these people at the Passover time who, man, they believed in Jesus really because of these signs. Jesus was doing these miracles, and they're like, man, we believe in Jesus. And it says that Jesus didn't entrust himself to anyone because he knew what was in the heart of everyone. 
And that's kind of the hinge point to chapter 3 and chapter 4. So one of the downsides of moving really slowly like this through the Gospel of John is you can miss some of what's going on. It's, it's sometimes difficult to remember like, ah, we're in a specific context here. There's something that's come just before that that's really important for this. So that serves as the hinge point. Like Jesus didn't entrust himself to anyone because he knew what was in man. He actually came to deliver man from himself. And then in chapter 3 and in chapter 4, we see that both religious people and irreligious people need to be saved. Like Jesus didn't just come for irreligious people who've never heard of who God is and didn't grow up with, in a Christian home or anything like that. But we're also going to see today that religious people actually need to be saved. Folk who like grew up in the South, and you're like, I was in church, I got born on Friday, and we were released from the hospital Saturday, we were in church on Sunday, like, I'm good, I'm in, I'm saved, whatever that means. Jesus would actually say, maybe you're, maybe you're not. So this is where we are in chapter 3. So let me give you the, the path today, because we're going to cover, like, we're going to cover a lot, and so this is the path, kind of where we're headed. First, we're going to see the problem, chapter 3. 2 verse 23 through 3 verse 3. We're going to see God's solution to that problem. We'll see God's provision. And then we'll answer, we'll ask and hopefully answer the question, well, why did God act? Here's what I want to challenge you to do. John 3.16, even if you're like, I didn't grow up in the church and I'm not familiar with the Bible, you're probably familiar with John 3.16. Maybe you grew up watching WWF as it used to be like the appropriate title. You're like, I remember seeing that on a billboard when I watched these guys wrestle each other. Uh, Like you've seen this on a coffee mug. I want to challenge you to try as best as you can by the Spirit to hear this with new ears. To say, I don't want the things that are familiar to me to grow common. You're like, oh yeah, God so loved the world that He sent His only Son that whoever believed in Him would not perish but have everlasting life. Like, slow down. Let's talk about that, okay? John chapter 3, John chapter 2, beginning in verse 23, first we'll see the problem. And the problem is everyone needs to be saved. Everyone. There's nobody who walked in here today that left to yourself, you're like, me and Jesus, we're good. I come from good stock, good family, I'm religious, it's all the irreligious people that need to be saved. No, everyone does. Verse 23 of chapter 2 says, While he, Jesus, was in Jerusalem during the Passover festival, many believed in his name. When they saw the signs he was doing, Jesus, however, would not entrust himself to them since he knew them all. And because he did not need anyone to testify about man, for he himself knew what was in man. Or mankind is probably a better way to translate that. Knew what was in humans. Verse 1 of chapter 3, there was a man from the Pharisees, Pharisees are are religious leaders during this time, named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to him, came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi or teacher, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform these signs you do unless God were with him. So here's what's going on in this scene. Jesus is doing these sign miracles, and at night, that's, that's, that's pretty significant, that Nicodemus, who is a religious leader during this time, he comes to Jesus, and he says, hey, we know that you're a teacher from God, because there's no way you could be doing these signs. No way you could have turned that water into wine and these other things. No way could you do that unless you're from God, which you'll see all throughout the ministry of Jesus, there are... There are believers and there are believers. And here's what I mean by that. There are people who believe in Jesus like Nicodemus. Like clearly you're from God and uh, all these signs you do, that's great. But they don't believe that Jesus is actually who he says he is. They're like, you're from God. I just don't believe that you're the son of God. You're from God. I just don't believe that you're a man and God at the same time. So it's important to understand this, right? You've got believers who kind of, they see things that they can't deny in Jesus. And I think maybe that's a lot of you in here today. That you're like, yeah, I believe in Jesus. But you don't really believe in Jesus where you would say, he's God, he's king, I'm following my king, I have a heavenly father because of the finished work of Jesus in my place. 
Now think about it. This is a religious leader. He comes to Jesus by night, which I think there's a couple things going on there. One, the Pharisees are not a fan of Jesus at this time. And they're not going to be a fan of, if one of the leaders of the Pharisees, if they're like, why are you hanging out with that guy? He's calling us brood of vipers and crazy stuff like that. Whitewashed tombs. Why are you hanging out with that guy? So he goes at night probably to avoid some awkward conversation. But John's also highlighting this so that we'll know Nicodemus is actually spiritually blind. You're going to see all throughout the Gospel of John, darkness and light kind of compared together. And so for him to say he came in the darkness of the night, he's trying to help you see there's blindness going on in him. That though he knows God, he doesn't truly know God. He's a religious person, remember. So here's what this means for us. Religious people and irreligious people, meaning people who are like, yeah, I believe in God and I, I try to do the right things and I try to not do the bad things and I don't, I don't drink, cuss, or chew and I don't go with girls who do, like all, all, those, all those things. Uh, Jesus is going to say, good on you none of that saves you. So religious people need to be saved and irreligious people. We'll see that in John chapter 4. Both camps, both those who, who are kind of, both those who are religious and who are depending on uh, what they do to make them right with God and those who are irreligious really come from the same camp and say like, it's really up to me. My destiny, my beliefs, my system, they're all up to me. Religious people just say, well, if I do 51% good things to 49% bad things, God will accept me at the end of the day. Religious people say things like, at the end of the day, I'm a, pr- I'm a good person. I'm a pretty good person. Well, the problem is, and that's why Jesus would say, well, hold on, maybe you believe, but you don't really believe because God's word says there's none righteous. No, not one. So it's tough for us to say, well, God, you say there's no one righteous. There's no one good in and of themselves. And I stand here, I'm like, well, I'm a pretty good, I'm a, I'm a good person. You know, it's, it's offensive in that moment to be like, God just didn't know that you were going to exist. There's none righteous, no, not one. Oh my gosh, he's great. I had no clue how good he was going to be. There's none righteous. This is what Paul says in, in Romans 3, quoting from Psalm 14. He says, as it's written in Psalm 14, there is no one righteous, not even one. There's no one who understands. There's no one who seeks God. All have turned away. All alike have become worthless. There is no one who does what is good, not even one. That's a problem. The problem is, it's not just like, it's easy for us to to come into church and be thinking about our friends that we really want here. We're like, man, they need to hear this. Jesus would say, you need to hear this. There's none righteous. No, not one. The problem is everyone needs to be saved. Everyone. Religious, irreligious, grown up in the church, grown up out of the church, left to themselves, they're in the same camp. If that's the problem, look at God's solution in verse 4. Verse 4. John 3, verse 4. Remember, Jesus said, truly I tell you, unless someone is, bo- or, uh, excuse me, verse 3. We'll start there. Jesus replied to Nicodemus, who says, hey, you're a teacher. You've come from God, clearly. He says, truly, I tell you, unless someone is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus is like, wait, wait, wait a second. How can anyone be born when he's old? That's a pretty natural question. Jesus is like, you want to see the kingdom of God? You've got to be born again. He's like, I'm old. (laughs) How am I supposed to be born again? He's thinking Jesus is talking physically. And he's like, Jesus, God, man, I knew you were crazy. I've already been born once, and I don't think my mom wants to do that again, right? <laughs> Verse 4, how can anyone be born when he's old? Nicodemus asked him. Can he enter his mother's womb a second time and be born? Jesus answered, truly I tell you, unless someone is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Whatever is born of the flesh is flesh, and whatever is born of the Spirit is spirit. Verse 7, Do not be amazed or don't be surprised that I told you you must be born again. The wind blows where it pleases and you hear its sound, but you don't know where it comes from or where it's going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. Verse 9, how can these things be? Asked Nicodemus. That's a pretty natural question. Nicodemus misses the point Jesus is trying to make. 
The problem is everyone needs to be saved. God's solution is new birth. Um, when Jesus says born again, another way to say that is born from above. And Nicodemus doesn't realize that Jesus is talking about something different than birth in the flesh. That's why he says, he who's born of the flesh is, is of the flesh. He who's born of the spirit is of the spirit. He misses the point. Literally, Jesus is saying, unless you're born from above, you're in trouble. You're not going to see the kingdom of God. He is telling, this would have been crazy. He's telling a leader of the Jewish people. Jewish people believed that because they were Jewish people, that they would see the kingdom of God. All the promises in the Old Testament. They're like, so he's telling not only a Jewish person, but a religious leader of the Jewish people, unless you're born again, you're not in. You're not going to see the kingdom of God. This is one of the reasons religious leaders weren't a big fan of Jesus. Because he kept saying things like that. Now for us, like we need to pause and say, like you really need to think about it. You know that, that old like, uh, I don't know, illustration or funnies maybe in the Farsight thing where you, you die and you show up in heaven at the pearly gates and Peter's there and he's like, why should I let you in? It's probably helpful to answer that question. If someone were to ask you, why should you be let into heaven? Man, I'm telling you, I, I know a lot of church folk that the way they answer that is you start to be like, I mean, I, I believe in God. I read my Bible as often as I can. I do the right things. You, you wouldn't believe what some of my friends do Saturday night and then they don't even come Sunday, and I don't, I don't do any of that. What Jesus is going to say is, being from the right family, having parents who have the right faith, maybe you're like, I, I mean, I'd start talking about, man, you should have met my grandma. My grandma, man, she loved the Lord, and she was at church all the time, and she would take me every Christmas and Easter. Jesus would say, I didn't ask about your mom and him. I asked about you. You must be born from above. He, he says born from water and spirit, which is an interesting thing. There's been a whole lot of like... This is interesting because it, it, when you read commentators, um, theologians on this, there's like general agreement and then there's certain parts in the Gospel of John where they're just like... Phew, they're just all over the place. This is one of those parts. We were like, well, does it mean you have to be baptized? And then, you know, some of you grew up in environments where you're like, it's really clear right there, unless you're born from the Spirit, meaning unless you start praying in tongues, you're not in. You're not going to see the kingdom of God. That's not what's going on in this text. Jesus is talking about the fulfillment of something that was prophesied hundreds of years before this. In Ezekiel 36, the prophet Ezekiel from God said to the people of God, God's word. He says, God says to the people, I will also sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean. I will give you a new heart. That's what it means to be reborn, born from above. God is cleansing you and He's giving you a new heart. And I will put a new spirit within you. I will remove your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. I will place my spirit within you and will cause you to follow my statutes and carefully observe my ordinances. That's what Jesus is talking about when he says to be born from above means to be born from water and spirit. It means that God has done something in and of himself to rescue you, to set his love on you, to sprinkle you clean through the blood of Jesus shed in your place, to give you a new spirit, to give you a new heart. That's what it means to be born from above. So God's solution to the problem, everyone needs to be saved, is God acting and actually causing you to be born again, to be born from above. New heart, new spirit, new desires. The solution is God acting to bring new life. Birth from above. Now, how does he do that? Like how, how does God do that? We'll see that in God's provision. So the problem is, everybody needs to be saved. Religious, irreligious, grown up in the church, never set foot in the church. Growing up in the church, if you're like, no, nah, I can't step foot in the church because that place will burn down if I walk in there. Everybody needs to be saved. The solution is new birth from above. Here's God's provision for that new birth. 
the cross of Jesus Christ. Look at verse 10. Remember, Nicodemus asked, how can these things be so? How can new birth, how can that happen? Verse 10, Jesus says, are you a teacher of Israel and don't know these things? That's, just, that's, that's a bit harsh. You know, he's like, you're a teacher of Israel and you don't know your Bible? Interesting. Let me learn you something. Jesus replied, <laughs> verse 11, truly I tell you, we speak what we know and we testify to what we have seen, but you do not accept our testimony. If I have told you about earthly things and you don't believe, how will you believe if I tell you about heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except the one who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. He's referring to himself. Verse 14, just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up so that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. Now, Jesus brings up this illustration of something that had happened. Nicodemus would have heard that and been like, I know exactly what you're talking about because we're not, most of us in here are probably not Jewish people. You, you may not know what he's talking about. The people of Israel had been enslaved to the Egyptians for over 400 years. And God came and through signs and wonders and an outstretched arm, he set them free from their captivity. And then they're in the wilderness. And in that wilderness, in the desert, they spend 40 years wandering around the desert. God again and again and again provides for them. They don't have water. God provides water. They don't have food. God provides food. And if you've read this, you can read this in the book of Exodus in the Old Testament. The people of God are always complaining. Whatever God has done, it's not enough. Whatever God has done, they forget it the next day or the next page. It's a regular pattern. You and I are in good company right? Very forgetful. Very much like, God, how are you going to get me through this? It's like, well, let's look at the track record. I got you this far. I ain't going to leave you now. This is the people in the Exodus account. And what Jesus is talking about is this story in Numbers 21, where the people, God had made, like, <laughs> they didn't have food, and they complained to God, they complained to Moses, who then goes to God, and he's like, these people just keep complaining. Like, are you sure you didn't mix up who you wanted to save? And, and they're complaining about food, and God says, hey, tomorrow morning when they walk out, there's going to be manna on the ground. There's going to be food on the ground. Manna means what is it? It's an interesting word for it. They're like, what is this? I don't know. Let's call it manna, okay? So there's manna on the ground, and they would go out, and they would collect this, this food. A little while later, they're like... <laughs> They've forgotten that they didn't have food and now they have food. They're like, well, I don't like this. It probably had carbs in it. There's probably people who are like, I, I'm, I'm carb toast intolerant and I, I don't do well with gluten and God, I, need, I, don't, I don't like this anymore. And so they start complaining to God. They start complaining to Moses. They're like, why would, why would he lead us out here? We don't have any food, not any food that we like anyway. And God, to punish them, he sends these snakes into the camp. And these snakes are biting the people, and they're dying. And it, it says they're fiery serpents, meaning like when they bit, it burned really badly. And the people complain to Moses. They're like, oh, we've sinned against God. What do we do about this? Moses goes to God, and he intercedes for the people. And God says, I want you to uh, raise on a staff a bronze serpent. And if the people will look at that serpent, I'll heal them. Which just picture, I just want you to picture, if you were in a camp and there's snakes everywhere and they're biting everybody, your friends are dying, and somebody said, Moses comes and he said, hey, I've talked with God. He said, I just need to take this bronze serpent, I'm going to raise it up on a staff, and everyone who looks at that serpent will be healed. I think I would be like, anything about an antidote? Or, or like, where do we hit the snakes to kill them, to incapacitate them? Do you have any garden hose or swords or something like that? I'm supposed to just look at this, but he says, I don't know. And then the text is really clear that there are some people who don't look at the, they don't look at the bronze snake. They kind of like we do. They take things into their own hands. I'll figure this out on my own. That plan doesn't sound like it's going to work. And what Jesus is saying is that plan whereby when the people actually looked at, we've got an image of this actually um, right there, like when the people looked at that snake, it was pointing forward to something. It was pointing forward to something that Jesus would do. Snakes in Scripture are symbolic of sin. 
If you know the story of Adam and Eve, it's, it's a snake, our great enemy, who came in and tempted Adam and Eve, and it's through that that sin spread uh, throughout humanity. The people try to take think, care of things for themselves, and aren't, aren't we the same? When you're feeling like, man, I, I feel separation between me and God, or I feel like God might not accept me, what often do you do? I don't think it's very often that we look to Jesus look and live, we like the Israelites are like, well, what's the antidote? What can I do? How do I, how do I get rid of these snakes? What do, I, do I need to call some friends to help me get rid of these snakes? What do, what do I need to do? Remember Romans 3.10 says there's none righteous, no, not one. And God's provision in the same way that the snake was raised up, Jesus says, I'm going to be raised up and everyone who looks to me for salvation will be saved. That's how the new birth happens, by looking to Jesus. 2 Corinthians 5.21, Paul says that he, God, the Father, made the one who did not know sin, Jesus, to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. You, you want to know how to be made right with God? Look and live. Look to the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. You, you're not going out of here and saying, okay, I need to do all the right things and I need to avoid doing the wrong things. God says you can't do that. He knew you couldn't rebirth yourself. He had to do that. It's action external to you that causes you to be reborn. And you're saved. The provision of God is in the cross of Jesus Christ where the perfect, sinless Son of God hung in your place. So like everything that we do, the singing, praying, coming to the Lord's Supper, to communion, hearing the Word taught, we, we really have one message in all of that. And it's not, go get them, tiger, you can do it. It's behold the Lamb of God. Look and live. Christ was crucified in your place. New birth happens only by you looking, like the Israelites, to the one hanging on that piece of wood and saying, Jesus, save. Jesus, save, because I can't do it. Kent Hughes says, the command to look to that uplifted serpent was a gracious, gracious foreshadowing of looking to the Christ for our salvation. New birth comes through, through faith in uh, God's provision, beholding Jesus Christ over and over and over again. Those people in Israel, like, they look, they're healed. I just kind of wonder, did they get bit again a second time? Because the pattern of, the fo- of a follower of Jesus isn't you look to the cross one time, Jesus saved, and then you're like, well, thanks, I'm going to take it from here. The pattern is over and over and over again saying, Jesus, I need you. Jesus, rescue me. Jesus, continue to change me into what I already am. Everyone needs to be saved. God's solution is new birth from above, and His provision is the cross of Jesus Christ. And the natural question should, I, should be, Why did God act? Have you thought about this? The people of Israel, they got snakes all in there. Why would God provide for them? Why would He not just be like, hey, you little snaky snakies, go take them all out. And I'm going to start over with some people who will be grateful for the ways that I've provided for them. You know? I think of often... There's a saying in the Murphy family that Murphys eat what's set in front of them and are grateful for it. And um, the the people of Israel, the problem is I took that way too seriously and ate what was set in front of me and a lot of other people. That's neither here nor there. Um, It should be a natural question, why did God act? You ever thought of that? Uh, I think that God has made me enough of a knucklehead that I often think, why? Like, why me? Knowing who I was, knowing what I'd become, knowing the things that I would have the tendency to say yes to rather than Jesus, knowing that I, like the people of Israel, am going to forget what God has done and run towards things that take me away from God. Like, why? Why? He tells us in John 3, 16 and 17. Look at this. and Man, I'm, I'm just praying that you hear it with new ears this morning. For God loved the world in this way. 
he gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. That is the, the unfathomable, bottomless love of God on display. Like why? Why did God act? Because of his great love. Because God knew, like we're not, Charles Spurgeon famously said, if it were up to me to choose God, I never would have made it in, right? That's a paraphrase. Uh, Charles Spur- like, but that's true. If it were up to me to look at all the evidence and say, well, Buddhists, okay, they got some interesting things to say. And um, Islam, that has some interesting things to say. But I think I'm going to go with, with Christianity here. Like if it were up to me to say, hey, there's nothing you can do to save yourself. God has to act from outside yourself. God himself had to come. If you ever think about like what we believe really is crazy, that God came as a man, that God gave himself for you and I, and that God day by day is changing us into what, how he already sees us as sons and daughters of God. The, the, the gospel, this is, Martin Luther called this the, the gospel like in short form. God so loved the world. The, the way I think the CSB translates this is so helpful because what he's really trying to say is God loved the world like this. This is how. So it's not like, well, God, you love the world this way and I'm going to love people this way. And like God defines, dictates love. Not only, not only is it true that God is love, but that God actually decides to. There's, there's will at work in God when it says that he loved the world like this. God actually said, this is how I'm going to love the world. That he gave. Like, have you ever thought about how amazing that is? I, I think it would have felt like good news if it was like God so loved the world that he told them what they needed to do to get to heaven. That would be like, well, at least he gave us a path. That's not what it says. It says God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever would believe in Jesus, who would say, Jesus, I cannot save myself. I believe that you are the perfect, sinless, spotless lamb of God. I believe your life was lived in my place, the life that I should have lived. You lived perfectly. And Jesus, I'm banking everything on that. When I get to heaven, I'm not laying out all the ways that I'm awesome because they're going to be like, nah, you're not, you're not getting in. They're like, hey, why should we let you in? We're going to say, because Jesus said I could come. Because the spotless Lamb of God didn't stay in heaven and told me all the things I needed to do, all the ways I needed to be a good person. He said, there's actually nothing you can do, which is why I'm leaving heaven to come and rescue you, to snatch you up and to bring you into my kingdom. What are we pleading before the throne of God? The shed blood of Jesus. We're we're saying, no, 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 I'm not perfect, but I know one who is, and everything I got, I'm putting in that account. Not my own, not my like, well, I hope I do things right. I'm putting it all there. Why did God act? How does all this work? How is new birth possible? Because God gave his son. The result of God's action is whoever believes in Jesus, look and live, that snake hanging up, whoever looks on Jesus will not perish, but will have eternal life. Eternal life meaning experience the full blessing and rule of God both in this life and in the age to come. True hope. One of my favorite hymns is um, this hymn called The Love of God by Frederick Lehman. And um, I may have a hard time just reading this, much less singing it. I'm not going to sing it, don't worry. Um, I just, I, I'm telling you guys, the Lord has just made me enough of a knucklehead, enough of a guy who just can't get his act together that I am continually blown away at the depth and the length and the breadth of Christ's love for me. Frederick Lehman, he's, he's writing about this, and he says, the love of God is greater far than tongue or pen can ever tell. 
It goes beyond the highest star, which is interesting to me in light of this new satellite that's been out there. Like we're getting pictures from billions of light years away that we've never seen. He's writing, it goes beyond that galaxy and those stars that we just saw that we didn't know were there. And it reaches to the lowest star, the lowest hell. The wandering child is reconciled by God's beloved son, the aching soul again made whole, and priceless pardon one. Then the refrain is, Oh, love of God, how rich and pure, how measureless and strong it shall forevermore endure. The saints and angels song. As I was thinking about this hymn this week, um, I was doing some research on it and I found out something that I actually didn't know about this hymn. The last verse in this hymn actually wasn't written by Frederick Lehman. It was a verse that they found inscribed on the stone walls in an insane asylum when a guy in that asylum had died. And so it was this guy in this insane asylum who wrote this final verse. He says this, Could we with ink the ocean fill and were the skies of parchment made? The picture he's painting is like if all the oceans were ink and all the skies were a tapestry with which we could write on. Were every stalk on earth a quill, every tree in the world, if that was a pen, were everyone ascribed by trade to write the love of God above would drain the ocean dry. Nor could the scroll contain the whole, though stretched from sky to sky. Hey, God really loves you. And there's a plural nature to that. God really loves all y'all. But He really loves you. He loves you enough knowing that you would, like the Israelites, run away from His love, try to do things on your own, that you would forget what He's done from you, that you would shake your fist at God. And He still loves you. So where do we go, where do we go from here? Verse 18 says this, anyone who believes in him, in Jesus, is not condemned. But anyone who does not believe is already condemned because he has not believed in the name of the one and only Son of God. This is the judgment. The light has come into the world and people loved darkness rather than the light because their deeds were evil. For everyone who does evil hates the light and avoids it so that his deeds may not be exposed. But anyone who lives by the truth comes to the light, comes to Jesus, so that his works may be shown to be accomplished by God. The, f- the final question I want you to just consider is, how will you respond to the light? you can't claim ignorance anymore. You can't say, like, I I didn't know. I didn't. We're holding it out to you and saying, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. You're not going to make it on your own. Only Christ can save you. You need to be born from above and there's nothing you can do to make that new birth happen. The only way it happens is by you saying, Jesus, I am a sinner in need of a Savior. This morning when I was walking in here, I saw at the beginning of my Bible, I have this little phrase written by a Puritan pastor named Richard Baxter. And it says, preach is never sure to preach again as a dying man to dying men. I don't know if I'll be here next week. I don't know if you'll be here next week. So many of you know life is fragile and it can change in an instant. And what God is saying to you is that today's the day of salvation. He's saying, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. That God's not standing over you, arms crossed, saying, get to work. Prove that you're worthy of my love. He's saying, I sent my son to live the life that you never could. You feel like a failure? You feel like, man, I just can't do it. I can't get my act together. He's saying, that's why Christ came. 
Christ lived, Christ died, Christ rose again. There's salvation in no other name but the name of Jesus. And so the call is, look to Jesus and live. Live. 